Hi, and welcome to Chapter 5 of Tsotsi. Uh, chapter 4, we saw Tsotsi's first attempts at looking after this baby. And now in Chapter 5, our attention is drawn once again to the other members of the gang, what has happened to Boston, and then, of course, the unharmed uh, other members, the Arp and uh, Butcher. What's happened to them? Are they expecting Tsotsi to plan further crimes now that Boston's still injured? Uh, and we have at the beginning of this chapter, uh, this church comes into the scene. And perhaps we wonder at this point, does the church offer any escape from this gritty world of apartheid and nastiness and grittiness that we've seen so far. We're not going to get an answer to this question now. And even at the end of the novel, the function of the church is blurry. But here's the first mention of the church, a possibility of something other than this gritty apartheid world. Chapter 5. In the time that Tsotsi sat thinking in the ruins, Two unimportant and unnoticed events took place in the township. Gumboot Lamini was buried and Boston awoke. The cemetery was an acreage of crowded sandy soil. And look at the gritty details in, even in the cemetery. There was a fence around the perimeter, but termites had got into the poles and eaten them away at the base. Most of them now hung free of the ground, and a few had fallen over, dragging the wires down with them. The cemetery was really an accident. The people had had to bury their dead. And when the authorities came around to discussing the matter, the cemetery already existed. It was then hurriedly made official, because with that strange reverence that authority has for dead bodies, they sent in a team of workmen to erect the fence and to plant trees at regular intervals along its length. The trees were a failure. They were meant to be cypresses, but someone had made a mistake at the nursery. At least three quarters had died, and the survivors had grown up deformed and twisted out of all resemblance to what was intended. Even the trees are sick in this gritty world. They were a type of pine with a deep, almost black-green foliage. If you took your sorrow to their shade, you got covered all over by the sticky, resinous secretion on the trunks and branches. The trees do not even succeed in providing a place for you to take your troubles. Gumboot had been allocated a plot near the centre. He was buried by the Reverend Henry Ransom of the Church of Christ the Redeemer in the township. The minister went through the ritual with uncertainty. He was, dis he was disturbed, and he knew it, and that made it worse. If only he had known the name of the man he was burying. This man, O oh Lord, what man? This one, this one here, fashioned in your likeness. What does it matter what his name was? This one, this man. He had seen the face briefly when the police called him in. It was the hate the hideous, distorted hate of its grimace, of this face that's been pulled, that he remembered now. And we know the reason for that look on the face. It's the obscene words that Tsotsi whispered into his eyes as he died. This one, O oh Lord, this man fashioned in your image. The other person at the graveside was Big Jacob the Digger, he had taken off his hat with respect and was resting on the spade. While the minister prayed, Big Jacob studied his head. It was the hair that fascinated him, very white and wispy, something like the seeds of a certain weed that drifted away under umbrellas of thin silken threads. A wind was blowing now, ruffling the shock of hair, and he thought that if he waited long enough, he might see it fly off. The Reverend Henry Ransom crossed himself and looked up at the sky with a frown. 
Big Jacob looked down and played with the brow of his hat. Who is he? he asked. The minister looked at him once, very quickly, then back at the sky. He lifted his shoulders in a gesture of defeat. I don't know, he said. Big Jacob scratched his head before putting his hat back on. Friday night, he said. We'll say we buried Friday night on Saturday afternoon. Big Jacob began to push the soil into the grave. It wasn't necessary to shovel. It was all sand. The minister turned and walked back to his church. He was sorely troubled. And now we turn our attention to Boston. What's happened to him since he was beaten up and seems he's been unconscious since then because only now is he waking up. Boston awoke and the first thing he saw was the little boy standing quite still, watching him over the bicycle wheel rim he was using as a hoop. To be exact, it wasn't the first time he'd opened his eyes since the arp and butcher had carried him out of Sookie's and dumped him where he now found himself, in a back alley. Once in the early morning, and again at noon, his eyelids had fluttered and opened and he tried to get up. But pain had moved along every nerve in his body, and he had dropped back the few inches of his effort, unconscious. Now he tried again. So he sees this boy, and uh, his trousers have uh, his trousers have been stolen. Uh, but there's another pair lying on the ground, and Boston gestures at the trousers, but the little boy ran away. There was nothing for Boston to do but crawl across to the trousers. It took a long time, and when he'd reached them, he was crying. Every move had brought its own individual wave of pain. So he puts these trousers on. Where am I going as he staggered down the alleyway? It doesn't matter, he thought. Nothing matters now, not a single thing. He had seen his body and felt his face. He had remembered Tzotzi. There's nothing left. It's all finished now. At last, every single bloody thing is finished. He felt like saying goodbye to the earth and the sky and the sun. If there had been a tree nearby, he would have shaken its hand. He was convinced it was all utterly finished. Poor Boston. And now the other members of the gang, waiting outside Totsi's room. Totsi's probably still coming back from leaving the baby at the ruins. He won't come, Butcher said bending forward to pick up a few stones, which he started throwing at a lamppost. He will, said the Arp. They were lounging about on the pavement outside Totsi's room. Anyway, I don't care, Butcher added. Same here, said the Arp. This had been going on for a long time. The trouble was neither of them knew what to think about the fight at Suki's last night, whether or not Totsi had included them. In his attack on Boston, is Totsi sick of them too? They'd been discussing the matter ever since. Did it mean, for example, that the gang was finished, or just Boston? He certainly was. He was more finished than anything they'd ever seen. He was so finished he was almost dead. Suki hadn't been able to help. I heard nothing, I tell you. Just all of a sudden, like Boston cries. Or what was Totsi doing? Kicking him. Oops. Got lost there. Kicking him. What's he say? Who? Totsi. Nothing. And Boston? He was crying, man, like I tell you. They hadn't worried much about it then because the day was finished, a job done, they'd drunk a lot and taken a woman, that poor woman Rosie, in the Shabin. Soon they would sleep. It emerged as a real problem the next day when they awoke. Time always posed the same question. What can I do with it? Your only escape from this predicament or this big decision lay in a gang because that had a leader 
and he decided what to do. Having a leader means you don't have to think for yourself. For a long time, they'd been following Totti in this way. The prospect of getting through a whole day without him was unsettling. They discussed the matter sitting in the morning sun. So what do you say? asked Butcher. He didn't say nothing to us, said Diab. So? So I don't know, said Diab. He was finished all right. Who? Boston man, truly. So do you think he wants us? Butcher waited. Speak, man. I don't know, said the Arp unhappily. I tell you, I don't know, man. They drifted in the style through the day, through the streets, stopping for a drink, there for dice, something somewhere else for something to eat, pulled on by gravity of habit and dependence, so that around the middle of the afternoon, almost you might say by accident, since they were so free of a conscious purpose, they found themselves outside Totsi's room. They waited a long time, lounging around on the pavement. He won't come, Butcher said. He will. Anyway, I don't care. Same here. Butcher was throwing his stones at the uh, lamppost. About every fourth found its mark with a dull, metallic note. If he doesn't come, I'll just go. Clung! As a stone hit the lamppost. I got places and people. I can go right now. Clung, clung. The arp had joined him in throwing stones at the lamppost. And you? Butcher asked. Same here, said the arp. Clung, but we don't believe them that they have anywhere else to go. Boston dusted off his hands. I mean, Butcher, sorry. Butcher dusted off his hands. He had enough of throwing stones. He thinks he's good, but I can go. Clung! The arp was still throwing. Come, let's go, said Butcher. Okay, the arp paused while he threw another stone. Clung! Butcher had his cap so low over his eyes that when the arp nudged him, he had to tilt back his head to see Totsi, who had turned into the street a little way up and was walking towards them. They were both glad because one way or another the matter would be settled. Totsi went into the room without saying a word to them. He ignored them quite simply because he himself did not know what he wanted. Butcher and the Arp were in a strange way remote from his new realities. The new reality of the baby. And realities, because the other reality is he's, uh, he's now conscious of his memories and wants those memories to come back. It was difficult to think about them, to decide purposefully if he wanted them or not. So what was he going to do? There they stood waiting for a word or a look from him. He was going to do nothing. Matters would take their own course. Something was sure to happen. And that would start something else. And one way or another, the problem would resolve itself. So Butcher and the Arp stood outside, looking at each other. And Totsi sat down on his bed in his room. What happened was this. A young and comely woman, an attractive woman, carrying her baby in a blanket on her back, walked past in the street. The baby cried and Butcher looked up and saw her. Feed him, sister, he called. Come feed him here beside me. The woman, seeing him and the lights in his eyes, spat into the dust and went her way. Sotsi appeared at the door. He had heard Butcher's words and the baby. Encouraged by Totsi's interest, Butcher stepped away from the wall and called out to the back of the woman. Oh, if you got no milk, sister, let him suck me. He turned to Totsi and smiled and said, Nyama, which means meat. Totsi was looking at this woman. There was a thought there, a big thought. So, uh, Butcher making this sexual joke here. But Totsi then gets this idea, a thought. Uh, and you can think what the thought might be. Here's a woman who has milk in her breasts. Butcher pulled his hat even lower over his eyes and walked up to Totsi. Shall we find one and play? he asked. Totsi shook his head later, he said. And he was referring to the big thought Butcher's words had put into his mind. But by then... 
the ice was broken. He had made contact with them again, so he said, Come, and turned back inside. Butcher and the Arb followed him happily. When they'd settled down at the table, Butcher screwed up his nose and looked around the room. Jesus, what smells in here? he said. Totsi said nothing, but went to a corner and rolled up the reeking or stinking swaddling clothes and threw them into the backyard. And here's another gritty detail, where almost immediately a host of flies descended on them. And later, a small and hungry dog dragged them away to a corner. They missed Boston that afternoon. They missed his lot of words. Butcher tried his best, but told each of his four stories in a few words. He's not a man of words like Boston is. Uh, once I took a man on the train and he had a hundred pounds. What else was there to say about the matter? A hundred pounds. Or the time of his escape. We killed him in the Quella van. We jumped on him. Boston would have gone on forever with a sentence like that. The four of us did jump on him and kick him. When these two were told, there was left only the time he'd worked with Morgan Blackjack Mohotso and the white woman whom he caught alone in the house. When those were also told, there was nothing left. They sat in silence, and for a long time the only sound was the strange sucking noises de Arp made when he put his big lips to a beer bottle. Tsotsi surprised them both with his question, Where's Boston? De Arp blinked, and Butcher opened his mouth, but nothing came out. It wasn't the thought of Boston that surprised. He'd been constantly but unvoiced in both their minds that afternoon. What surprised them was Totsi asking. He was looking at Butcher, waiting for him to speak. I don't know, Butcher said. Totsi closed his eyes and then looked into the street. Butcher fidgeted in his seat. He felt that capital should be made of the mention of Boston to keep the words flowing. But how? Maybe at Suki's place, he said. And then later, we left him there at the back. He struggled once more with the silence. He's bad. Vrachtig bad. Vrachtig meaning really. And he looked at the Arp, who took his lips away from the bottle, said bad, and then had another drink. Then Butcher gave up. The few sparks of interest and word about Boston died away. Tsotsi closed the subject by ignoring it as abruptly as he'd opened it and that only because he was thinking about condensed milk. He had decided to forget about it when he left the ruin. I've fed it. I've hidden it safe. I will come back tomorrow, he'd said to himself. In the meantime, I will carry on as always. It hadn't worked that way. The thought about the shoebox and its contents, the enigma or mystery of his memory of the bitch, these slipped away repeatedly into his consciousness, slipped back repeatedly into his consciousness, no matter how determinedly he'd thrown them out a few minutes before. The simplest thing started the sequence. Butcher had teased a woman, and before Totsi knew what was happening, he stood at the door thinking about the baby. A little later, Butcher had smelt the rags, and back it was again, the, but the baby, the shoebox, the blue gums, the bitch, over and over again, sometimes this cycle extending itself to include another detail like condensed milk, which is why he'd asked about Boston. He could have asked Boston about w which milk he should get. Added to this was another problem, which was much more elusive. It, it, it got away from him in Totsi's struggle. It started off quite simply as his awareness of Butcher and De Arp. They were there. He'd wondered if they would come, and they had. He himself had taken them in, taken them back, so to speak. Why then did he find himself looking at them at odd moments with something like irritation and impatience? Theirs was a ponderous presence. In a subtle, ill-defined way, it was intrusive almost an encumbrance, like they're getting in the way. He'd never been conscious of them like this before. 
In fact, it had only rarely or seldom happened that he'd been conscious of them at all, as the people with whom he lived and had to lead. Boston had been an exception because Boston could think for himself. Boston, through definite actions, had made Totsi aware of him. The same thing had happened now to Butcher and the Arp, yet they had done nothing. Out of this vague drift of feeling and thought, the two men at the table, alternating with the baby and the box and the bitch under the bluegum trees, emerged another problem. But this was as defined and decisive as the others were nebulous or hazy and vague. It was nearing the time when it was expected of him to announce the plan of action for the night, and he had nothing to say. How had it worked the other times? Boston would be talking, and they would be drinking and listening, only half hearing, adrift on the flow and sound of words, their eyes half closed except when groping for another bottle under the table, or reflecting on the length of shadows in the street, and by their length measuring the time between that moment and darkness. Boston telling his long, long story until somehow something, some small thing like a thought or a shadow or a feeling, even a word, some small thing like that would precipitate in his inward darkness a desire, minute, small, and murderous. That was the beginning, because with time it grew and became the purpose he finally spoke that led them out of the room and into the night. That was how it happened, but now it was different and not happening at all, and it wasn't just because Boston wasn't there. What was expected of him, what the other two were waiting for, was a decision, and this was something else that Sotsi had never been aware of before. It involved choice. Was it to be the trains again, or a taxi driver, or a darkened, deserted house in one of the white suburbs? These and their variations were his repertoire, his choice of stuff that he does. And they, Diarp, Moody, and Butcher, twitching with impatience now, were waiting for him to choose. It was the awareness of alternatives that disturbed Totsi and seemed to paralyze his will. Up to that moment, he had lived his life as the victim of dark impulses. They'd been ready rising to his moments of need all through his life. Where they came from he never knew, and their reasons for coming he had never questioned. What he realized now was that something had tampered and messed with the mechanism that had governed his life, inhibiting its function, stopping him from doing what he normally does. Tsotsi slammed a clenched fist into the palm of the other hand, and the other two, thinking he had decided, looked at him expectantly. He stood up and walked on stiff, nervous legs to the door. What'll we do, Tsotsi? Butcher asked. Speak, man. He closed his eyes and grabbed at his first thought. We go to the city, he said. This was hardly an answer, because the city was big, and going there could mean a taxi job, or prowling around for a dark house, or a drunk near one of the shabins around the mine dumps. It was vague, and an evasion It's getting away from the question. But Tsotsi didn't care, because the others, reacting to the purpose it suddenly gave to life, had stood up and were following him into the street. Butcher looked back once at the room. Did you smell, man? He asked the arp. There's something smelling in there, stinking like shit. And of course, we know it's those, the, the remains of the baby. But they have no idea. And that's chapter five. I'm thinking to peek at chapter six to see what that's going to be about. But terminal place, I see. And I know that's another gritty setting. Another ugly Johannesburg setting. But meanwhile... We see the gang seemingly kind of got purpose, but perhaps there's evidence that it's falling apart uh, due to big changes in Tsotsi. I hope you enjoyed Chapter 5. 
I hope to see you again when it's time for chapter 6. Have a happy day.